Hey there, <clears throat> welcome to First Look, post-Easter edition. I had a day yesterday to kind of recover a little bit. Uh, Holy Week and Easter is a kind of a different kind of intensity. It's really interesting because, uh, you know, Christmas has all of that, you know, uh, there's an extra service and there's um, things to do and lots of like parties and gatherings and whatever uh, but it's kind of spread out and but holy week has this kind of intensity to it and it's a fascinating it's a fascinating week because um what you i feel like you don't see as a you know just a person who's attending the service is first of all that you know there's a lot of work, of course, that goes into making all that happen. Um, you know, even if you're coordinating with the other churches, you know, Wexford and Highland, and we're doing that part of it. Um, you know, there's there's that element to it, uh, which is great. I like, I love the fact that we do these services now with other churches and kind of share share those things together. I think we're only better when we're able to do that together like that. But uh, you know, then there's even the people who are you're serving are different. Like you're a little different during Holy Week. And what I what I mean by that is that your your expectations I feel like are different, and but also the fact that you're hosting guests is different. One of the things I always uh, I've kind of learned over time is. I think that the uh, Easter is a fascinating day because on Easter you you get a lot of visitors, right? I mean, we have almost twice as many people in worship as we would on a, on a regular Sunday, and um, many of them are obviously you know not folks who attend regularly. And I am someone, as you know, who. I feel like has a rapport with you. You know, we, we have some humor, we have some, I don't want to call them inside jokes, but there's things that we do together, uh, which I think are fun and whatever. And I feel like we have all given ourselves the permission in a worship, in worship to laugh, you know, to, to do that. And sometimes I get responses from people and it's fun. Right? I, I love that part of it. On Easter, you have, again, you have a lot of people who don't attend regularly, you know, because they're from out of town or, you know, people's family or whatever. And uh, they don't know any of that. And so a couple of years ago, I realized, oh, no one's laughing at anything that we're doing. Like, it's not, okay. <laughs> and it's, and at first I thought, oh, well, I'm not being funny, which is very possible. Um, but I realized that even at places that were obvious jokes, obvious, like, this is a humorous story I'm telling in the sermon. Nothing. Just nothing. And I've come to the conclusion that I think that, that either people don't want you to do that, which is possible, or they're new, they're different, you know, they're visitors, so they don't know that they're allowed to. And so I've, I've started to treat Easter like much more just straight up and down. Like, like I'm the visitor, you know, I'm not gonna, um, and I, I think that that's a fascinating kind of element to it because uh, it changes the flavor of it. Now there's lots of weeks that, um, you know, that are, have a serious tone to them or I'm feeling like that, um, you know, depending on what happened that week, you know, I, I kind of changed the tone of the service based on the situation. And that's, so that's no problem. Like, it's not like I enjoyed any less. It's a, it's a wonderful service. Um, the, the brass and the music is fantastic. Um, you know, the, the people are always very warm and, and caring and thoughtful. And, um, you know, I, I like the way it goes a lot. Um, I just, it's just fascinating how different it is. Everything about Holy Week feels like a different church 
you know, in some ways, which I guess is is okay, but also kind of feels like oh, I'm missing that element of it. You know, I get another element. You know, I get something different. Um, but it's it's sometimes interesting to to kind of miss that element. But that's great. It is what it is. We're learning as we go. So now we're in this Easter season. And I always try to make sure I talk about it like an Easter season in the same way that we talk about it as a Christmas season. You know, during, we get to Advent, you get through Advent, and you get to Christmas, and we kind of treat it like, well, now Christmas is over because it's the day after Christmas, when in fact Christmas is just beginning, right? And that's what we try to like emphasize in our worship and the colors and everything, is that we have this time where... Um, we go from Christmas to Epiphany, and that's a season. So now we're kind of in that same spot, right? Now we're in Easter season. And so in Easter season, you have, um, you go, it goes from Easter to Pentecost. Um, you know, we're going get, to get to the Ascension. We're going to do that. Um, and so this is a, a time where we're thinking about what does it mean to be people of the resurrection, right? That's the, that's the idea. So I'm looking at the I'm looking at the, the services, I'm looking at the scriptures for the season and what hits me and you know, is there anything that kind of pops out as a theme? I don't we don't always have to go with the theme, but it, sometimes I think it's it's helpful that you know we have kind of, kind of these things we're thinking about. And they're sort of loose themes. You know, I try not to tie us too tightly, too firmly to an idea, but I, I just, I think that maybe my brain works like that, or maybe it's just nice that, you know, for like four or five weeks, we're kind of thinking in this mode, especially during seasons where we're looking at scriptures we've seen before, ideas we've seen before. So, you know, during Advent, during Lent, uh, during Easter, during Christmas, like kind of hitting on some different things. And so this, this first, this first week here, this first passage, after Easter, there's a couple of, of texts that we hit, you know, fairly regularly. Um, sometimes it's the it's the doubting Thomas uh, passage, which we're going to be looking at this week. Sometimes it's the um, passage that describes the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Uh, and but we you know we kind of we hit those with some regularity, and so I try to look at them a little bit differently. If I can, and then maybe connect them to um, connect them to Easter, connect them, you know, move, moving forward. So I was looking at the passage for this week and in the following weeks. I was kind of doing some planning for this season, you know, just to give Stephen and the staff an idea of like kind of where we're headed. And. Uh, What kept hitting me over and over again was, um, was that the people in the passages were kind of struggling with something. And it, it, so it wasn't, they weren't passages that were about kind of maybe focused on hope or inspiration or any of those things as much as they were. Um, at least this is the way I saw it. They were texts that um, really described people trying to work something out for themselves, which I think maybe struck me because this first text about Thomas is is clearly it's not about Thomas, but it's about the disciples who are trying to wrap their minds around what happened, and um, and so we we come to this place where um, where they're being confronted by Jesus and um, they're they're trying to get their heads around what will it mean for you to be resurrected um, it's it's starting from scratch really so everything that they knew up until that point was still relevant but now of course they had to see, Jesus, they had to see themselves, they had to see the world through completely different eyes. 
and um, and there was going to be a learning curve. There was going to be a there's going to be a struggle there. And so what you're going to see in these texts between now and Pentecost is I'm going to keep using the phrase I'm having trouble. I'm trouble having trouble seeing. I'm having trouble hearing. I'm having trouble. It's going to be kind of that. Um, and just trying to figure out what do we do or what what does God do or what do we do collectively at the church when we're struggling with how to respond, how to live, um, how to figure out what it means to be the resurrection people that we're, that we're trying to be. So that's that's kind of the idea. Like I said, it's not a very um, kind of controlling theme. I mean, it's not really focused on one particular idea, but it's just um, it's coming to terms with and accepting the fact that even though Jesus has done everything, that it's still going to mean us wrestling with it. And that's always going to be the nature of people is that we're always going to be trying to figure out what to do with the thing that's in front of us. So let's look at this text for a second and then maybe I'll be able to explain what I mean a little bit more. All right. So this starts with text for today is um, John 20. So John 20. And it starts with 19. <clears throat> now again, anytime I read John, I try to remind, well, not just John, but anytime I read a gospel, I try to remind you a little bit of just what's in the background in terms of the way that that author writes. Um, or what do we associate with that particular author? So like with Mark, we think of Mark as the earliest gospel. We think of um, Matthew as specifically written to uh, a more Jewish audience. Um, that Luke is written to more of a Gentile audience. And that John, which doesn't follow the pattern of either of the other three Gospels, um, is looking at Jesus as, from a more transcendent aspect, right? Um, that everything kind of points back to his eternal nature, right? We think about where that's the book starts. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, and that throughout the book, we we see the way that John writes as one who is trying to emphasize the transcendent nature of Jesus. So this last part, bread and butter for John. John 20, starting in 19, going to 31, 19 to 31. Right. <clears throat> when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Let me pause there for a second. So first, a pretty intense meeting, um, showing evidence, obviously, of, of who he is. But that idea is extraordinarily important. And you and I might take it for granted because, again, we have 2,000 years of hindsight. Um, but that idea that Jesus is extending the power of God you know, when it says breathing on them, the Holy Spirit, they are receiving 
some um, element of God's authority and presence in the world. And so what he says is that you can forgive sins. If you think about what got Jesus to where he was, he, you know, as someone who was going to be crucified, as someone who was being pursued by the religious authorities of the day, you can see how this is the beginning of I hate to use it in violent terms. I was, I was going to say the, the beginning of war, but the beginning of, or maybe stage two of a revolution. I don't know how to say it in words. That, um, an uprising. I, I, like All of those sound very violent, but I mean, it's the beginning of this new era of the kingdom. And if you're a, a Pharisee, if you're someone who thought, well, we've done our due diligence here. We have gotten, we got rid of Jesus. Uh, he was causing a lot of trouble. He was, um, he was doing things that were blasphemous. Like, we can't have that. He's going to disrupt the whole system here. We need to get rid of him. And you accomplish that. And then suddenly now, you're going to discover that, you know, his, his followers are saying he's alive and there's evidence that something has happened. Um, but now his disciples have been emboldened to be like, I don't want to say little messiahs, but be extensions of the ministry that Jesus was extending to everybody else. Um, that now they have some ability to do what Jesus did. And, perhaps more importantly, to claim the same types of things that Jesus claimed about himself, one who could forgive sins. And, you know, if Jesus was crucified for saying things like that, now we have his followers who are being given the same ability um, so what do you think is going to happen to them? And they had to have known that. Maybe they couldn't see it in that moment, but that's where things are headed. So that's the first part, the first thing to think about. It's just, just what Jesus does for them and the, um, the destiny, I guess you could say, that's waiting for them now. He says what he says. And does what he does. So that intensity, you might want to just hold on to for a second. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them whenever Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the, of the nails of his of my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here in my, in, and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God, and Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. I kind of skip by that last piece every time, like it's just sort of a wrap up. But as I was reading it, I realized that it's, that the book ends, um, or the book ends, the chapter ends. The same 
with the same kind of mentality as um, what Jesus tells to Thomas. Thomas is, is, didn't know what to do with this information about Jesus until he actually saw Jesus in the flesh. And Jesus says, blessed are those who believe, who do not see. And then the book, or the chapter ends with, um, now Jesus did many other signs, meaning Jesus did many other things that were amazing or that, um, you know, were proof of who he was or, you know, made people aware that he was around. Um, but I'm telling you the things. You don't have to see those things. I don't have to list them all for you. What I need you to do, the author is saying to us, is I need you to know that that's true and believe that it's true. I've already told you enough for you to believe, which is the point. Much like Jesus says to Thomas just a second ago, which I, I love. I, I love that, how that's layered. Um, I skip over that very often. I don't think about that very much. Uh, but you've heard me talk about Thomas uh, on a handful of occasions. I've been here long enough now that you've heard kind of my spiel on Thomas that I think he gets uh, a pretty harsh rap um, because by all accounts, he's a very thoughtful and faithful disciple. And, um, you know, we are much more like him than we are uh, like uh, some disciple who just gets it right away and has this kind of unwavering faith. You know, you, I am much more like Thomas than I am like someone else. So having trouble seeing, I think, is what I call the, the uh, sermon. And I think that it's... The, I think the, the hardest part, and maybe Thomas knew this, I don't know, is for Jesus to be resurrected, Thomas, I think, has enough sense because he has seen Jesus risk himself. One of the other passages where Thomas really plays a prominent role is that Jesus is thinking about going towards Jerusalem. And Thomas is like, are you sure that's a good idea? And he's like, yeah, it's where we're going. He's like, all right, well then let's, let's, let's mount up. Um, and like, if you go, we're, okay, here we go. Um, knowing that it was going to be dangerous. Like Thomas had, I think, a sense about him that he understood that Jesus was going to put them into the fire. Um, that he was willing to go there and that he was willing to take them there also. So part of me feels like Thomas must have known that if Jesus is coming back, this is a wonderful thing for the world, but it's not going to mean anything easy for us. So that if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to, if I'm going to get on my horse again and, and and ride into, you know, into danger, then I'm going to need to see Jesus say it basically to my face. Because um, I need to know he's with me. And I, I think that's what happens. Because it's not like he goes, well, you know, he says, my Lord and my God, like, all right, here we go. I'm, I'm ready. Um, and I think that that's... Um, uh, that I think is a pretty powerful way of understanding this, what this season can mean. It should make us, resurrection should make us re, kind of question everything. It should make us think about what's different now. And even though we understand and we would want to see something different, it, we don't always know how we're supposed to get there or what we're supposed to risk to get there. For instance, there are lots of things in the world that we know are awful. 
you know, we look at, at what's happening in Ukraine or Gaza, we see what's happening with, you know, school violence and school shootings and mass shootings in general. And we know and we pray for something to be different. We just don't always know or want to know what we're supposed to do. Um, how that's ever going to change. What am I going to put down? What, what am I going to rethink? What am I going to risk? So that there's a hope that something will be different. I'm having trouble seeing that. And, you know, I think that you know, we kind of fall into that Thomas category of, you know, our, of, I'm having trouble. And so I need to kind of hear, if I'm going to have any chance of doing something different, I'm going to have to hear it straight from Jesus. Well, we've heard it straight from Jesus and we're still struggling. And so I want to embrace that a little bit that hesitancy, that struggle. You know, that we have every advantage in the world. You know, that we're a congregation that cares about each other, that we're people that care about each other. Um, but we're not really sure how to use our voices. We're not really sure how to use our influence. We're not really sure even what our influence is. And so we're struggling to see maybe, uh, or have a vision for what that should look like. How do we actually make the world better? Those are the things I'm kind of going to be exploring, I feel like. Because we've seen the resurrection. We just celebrated the resurrection. We had joy and trumpets and the whole shebang. So what are we doing with that? What do we do with the... the all of that's been given to us. That's the challenge. That's what I'd like to explore a little bit. So, see where it goes. Anyway, all right. Uh, I have coffee to finish, and I, um, but I, I, I'm really appreciative that, like, week after Easter, you're willing to do this with me and, and chat with me a little bit about what this looks like. Um, I'll look forward to seeing where it goes, seeing what it stirs up. But uh, for this week, I hope that you recover well. I hope that you eat your weight in chocolate. I hope that you um, uh, stay dry because it is pouring right now. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful week. And I will see you next time for another first look. So until then. <laughs>